Rama Ashe Rama Ye Ete Rama Andosa Alaba Aka Yala Bosha Taranda La Bohosha Daba Aka Daka Kotoro Kosa Karando Bosata La La Mondo Boshe Talama Ikala Bohosha Daba Hata Iko tolo mondo bo shakala mandala bo ho shanda bahashata. Ika tala to salamahando bo ho shanda bahakata. Ika andala bo shanda bahakata kasata. Leko rabashete. As these men were praying for me a moment ago, I felt the Lord nudge me to do something here. And we're going to do this and then we're going to move on because I do feel the Lord wants me to speak on a few specific things. But there was a man with a withered hand. And it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had an encounter with him. He reached out and he stuck his hand in the coat of Jesus and that withered hand was restored and the Pharisees didn't like this because he was healing on the Sabbath but what they failed to realize is Jesus was the Sabbath and what just swept into this house was a it was a refreshing it was the rest where the weary find rest and I feel in the Holy Ghost that there are things in this house that have become withered. There are things in this house that have become withered. So what we're going to do for just a moment is we're going to take whatever it is in your life that you feel has become withered. You're going to plug into this rest and refreshing that has just swept into this house. And God's going to restore some things. There are relationships in this room that have become withered. Marriages in this room that have become withered. Ministries and giftings that have become withered. Emotions. Physical bodies that have become withered. I want you to lift your hands all over, your, all over the house. And just let that refreshing. There's ministry in this house. You're tired. You're weary. Let the Holy Ghost pour back into you in this room. Come on, that, that resting tongue, that refreshing tongue, you know what that's all about. Just let the Holy Ghost flow over you in this room. Come on, we've been warring, we've been plowing, we've been digging the last several weeks. Let God just refresh you. Come on. I really feel like we need to camp out here for just a minute. Would you lift your voice and just let God restore, let God make whole, let God refresh. Hata la boho sanda la bahakata. Ia la manda bakata la boho sanda bahakata.
I um <clears throat> I do feel very strongly that I'm uh, the Lord wants me to kind of just segue from this morning um just kind of build on that foundation that was laid let's lift our hands and let's pray one more time thank you Jesus thank you just connect with somebody that you're standing next to I, I want you to pray for them that God would pour virtue back into them that God would refresh that God would restore we're just going to build on that foundation that was laid this morning but right now I want you to just let the body minister to the body as the Holy Ghost refreshes going to end up here tonight I've never talked about what I'm about to talk about but the Holy Ghost knows where we're at and I know what I feel in my spirit and so this church knows how to flow this church knows how to flow so if you would you can be seated but let's be sensitive to the Holy Ghost and what God wants to do over the next few moments I just want to uh, sort of segue build on what I believe to have been a foundation that the Holy Ghost laid this morning in the vein of relationship and intimacy with Him. I've said it behind this pulpit before, but I just want to reiterate something, and I've heard Brother Shelton tell me this quite a few times, that... Um, before Brother Barnes passed away, he prophesied that there would be young prophets in the earth that would be able to control the elements of weather. And it would distract the spirit of Antichrist from persecuting the church. And what stands out to me about that is that there is a precedent that was set throughout Scripture on those that had influence in the earth realm and those that had the greatest influence in the earth realm were those that had intimacy in the spirit realm 
we have preached for years. And that scripture that talks about uh, the Holy Ghost bringing all things to your remembrance. That's not talking about behind the pulpit. It's talking about when God brings us before men and rulers and lost souls and we are giving an account for what we believe. God is going to bring things to our remembrance what it is we're supposed to say. And there is a precedent throughout Scripture on those that had influence with these, these kings and these rulers. And we have... We have believed and we have preached for so many years that those that are going to stand before world leaders and world rulers and influential people across the nations of this earth are going to be the academics of our movement. And that it's going to be the intellectuals of our movement. And it's going to be those that are uh, the ones that have the degrees and the scholars of our movement. But when you study throughout Scripture, and I realize there's the Apostle Paul who was an intellectual, who was a scholar, who had all of the academia, but he was the exception, not the rule. Because whenever Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, he can't remember And he needs somebody to tell him what the dream is and what the dream meant. It wasn't the Chaldeans. It wasn't the soothsayers. It wasn't the diviners. It wasn't the wise men. But there was a captive of the Hebrews that had been shut away in a prison cell. But three times a day he turns his face toward God. And he would lift up his voice and begin to call on the name of his God. Whenever the world leaders and uh, the, the kings and the rulers of this world, whenever they bring us before them, I want you to understand that there may be those from our movement that go before them that have the degree, that have the intellect, that have uh, all of the scholarly things and have the academia, but they better also have have a touch from another world. They better also have an authority in the spirit realm. But I want you to understand today that influence in the earth realm is birthed from intimacy in the spirit realm. I believe that, and I know this is a strong statement, but we can be more like the Pharisees than we care to admit. The Pharisees had the dress code just right. They had all of the religiosity. They had all of the vernacular. They had all of the spiritual checklists marked off. But their understanding of him was so vague that when he showed up, they did not recognize him. I want to make sure that when Jesus shows up, I know him well enough to know what he looks like when he gets here. And I have watched people across our movement that their understanding of God is so vague that they are one-dimensional in how they receive him. Whenever it's time to weep and cry, they want to dance and shout so they don't come to the altar and weep and cry. Or whenever it's time to dance and shout, they want to weep and cry so they don't dance and shout. They miss the visitation. I don't want to be so vague in my understanding of him that when a visitation comes, I miss it when it gets here. But I want to make sure that I know him. I want to make sure when that wind begins to blow that God does not have to send a strong gust of wind. But I can just feel the the gentle rustling of leaves off in 
in the distance. I, I don't want God to have to shake me to get my attention. I just want him to place his hand gently on my shoulder and know that Jesus is trying to get my attention. I don't want God to have to scream at me. Brother Shelton told me one time, he said, I don't know that it's a good thing if God's got to speak to us audibly. Everybody wants to strive for the audible voice of God, but I want you to know today, God should not have to speak to you audibly just to get your attention. I want to know the voice of God so well and so thoroughly that just a gentle whisper from the voice of my friend Jesus is all that it takes to get my attention. And in prayer coming into the new year, in prayer coming into the new year, the Lord began to lead me to the Song of Solomon and I began to study this and it is amazing to me the different facets that God relates to His people with. He relates to us as Father. He relates to us as friend. He relates to us as shepherd. He relates to us as king. He relates to us as prophet and priest. But it is one of the most beautiful allegories in Scripture. And that is the relationship between the bride and Jesus Christ as the bridegroom of the church of the living God. And the Lord led me to Song of Solomon 1 and this is, this is the bride speaking to the bridegroom and watch what she says. She said, draw me and we will run after thee. Now I want to let that settle in there for a minute. The bride is looking at the groom and she is saying, draw me. And there will be an urgency in me for fellowship with you. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, this generation runs to the pulpit and walks to the prayer room. We are so urgent to have revival that we have lost an urgency for relationship with him. We are raising a generation that knows how to work an altar but doesn't know how to worship at an altar. We are raising a generation that is seeking the pulpit but they are doing everything in their power to avoid the prayer room. But God has got to recalibrate this generation. Ladies and gentlemen, moves of God like the book of Acts and Acts chapter 2, it started when there was an urgency in them for a prayer meeting. And Azusa Street started with a prayer meeting. Houston, Texas started with a prayer meeting. Toronto, Ontario started with a prayer meeting. Azusa Street, it began with a prayer meeting. I pray that God would revive an urgency in us to get back to a place of prayer and get back to a place of relationship with God where we don't run to the pulpit and walk to the prayer room, but we run to the prayer room and walk to the pulpit with a word from God that is in our mouths. God forbid that we ever get to the place that we feel like revival is our first calling. Revival is not our first calling. Relationship is our first calling. And she said, draw me and I will run after thee. The king hath invited me into his chamber. She said, whenever there was an urgency in me for fellowship with the king, he gave me an invitation to a secret place with him. And it was not just any secret place. It was the chamber. You've got to understand that in scripture, the only way you gain access to the chamber of the king was was by invitation only. The reason that Esther got to go into the chamber of the king was because she found favor with the chamberlain and the chamberlain told her what the king expected and what the king required of her. And she looked at the king and he raised his scepter and bid her to come into a place of intimacy, a place of privacy, a place of fellowship, and a place of love with him. And so my question is, when I wake up in the morning and I don't receive the invitation, what am I not doing to get the invitation? 
When I wake up in the morning and I don't feel that longing uh, and I don't feel that urgency in me to go uh, to a place of prayer and spend time with God, what am I not doing that is causing God not to raise that scepter and bid me to come to a place of prayer? Oh God, that we would get back to a place uh, where we find favor with you, God, uh, where we walk the way you want us to walk uh, and we talk the way you want us to talk uh, and we dress the way you want us to dress and we think the way you want us to think and we act the way you want us to act so every day that we wake up and put our feet on the floor we can feel that urgency in us that says God if you'll draw me I will run after you is there anybody here that will let God know I want you to draw me to you I want you to beckon me I want you to summons me back to a place of secrecy and intimacy with you. And it was that intimacy with the king in a place of privacy that gave Esther influence with the king in the throne room. If you want influence in the earth realm, you better make sure that you never lose intimacy in the spirit realm. And she goes down just a few verses later. And there is a transition here. Watch what the bride says. She said, tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, uh, where thou feedest, uh, and where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. Uh, Notice the transition here. She went from a place of love uh, to now a transition to a place of labor. But the only reason she got to a place of labor was because she did not bypass the place of love. I had a young man come to me before I was getting ready to take the pulpit one time. And he said, Brother Herring, I had been there eight or nine weeks at that point. And he said, Brother Herring, he said, I've got a question for you. He said, how do you flow in the Holy Ghost when you're behind the pulpit? And I said, well, it's very simple. I flow in the Holy Ghost behind the pulpit the same way I flow in the Holy Ghost in my prayer closet. There should never be a disconnect from the place of love to the place of labor. It is the same exact flow. The reason I know what angels feel like in a church service is because I've become acquainted with the presence of angels in my prayer closet. The reason I know the voice of God behind the pulpit is because I've become acquainted with the voice of God in my prayer closet. There should never be a disconnect from our place of love to our place of labor. But every time I stand behind this pulpit, it's not a manipulated message it is a word that God has given me in a place of prayer God has got to recalibrate this generation I want you to know your first calling is not the pulpit your first calling is the prayer closet your first calling is not revival your first calling is relationship your first calling is not the place of labor it is the place of love and when you get relationship right revival is automatic when you get intimacy right in the spirit realm influence in the earth realm is automatic There are gifted individuals in this house. Uh, Brother William Spriggs, you are a gifted young man. Uh, Brother Nathaniel, you are a gifted young man. Uh, Brother Tommy, the gift of faith uh, is all over you. There are young ladies in this house uh, that are intercessors, uh, that are prayer warriors. uh, But don't you ever get to the place uh, where you'd rather preach uh, than you would rather pray. Uh, I'll pass this mic off every day of the week, uh, but give me an altar. Give me a place uh, where I can fall in love with Jesus. Jesus, uh, give me a place uh, where I can spend time with him. We need to pray right here. Let's lift our hands and our voices all over the house. Come on. Come on, God's calling somebody back to relationship.
That's why, that's why it is so important for you to understand when it comes to relationship with Him. Be seated for a moment, but keep your spirit open. That's why you've got to understand when it comes to relationship with Him, exactly the way He views you. Because God wants relationship with you more than you want relationship with Him. You say, well, this is not a typical evangelistic sermon. No, it's not. You know why? Because I'm here to minister to the bride. We get so caught up on birthing the revival that if the mother is not ready, we can't raise the child when it's born. And so the Holy Ghost is here to to recalibrate key individuals in this room that are going to play an integral part of the harvest God's going to give this church. And the reason you're going to have revival is because it's going to flow from a place of relationship. When you get back to relationship, revival begins to flow out of relationship. And so you've got to understand exactly the way God views you when it comes to this whole relationship thing. Because we quote the scripture in Song of Solomon 2, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. And we relate that to one of Jesus Christ's I am statements in the New Testament. But when you study that, you will find out that that is not the bridegroom speaking in that verse. That is the bride describing herself. I am the lily of the valley. I am the rose of Sharon. She described herself as two beautiful, yet common flowers. The bride's problem was she knew she was beautiful, but she thought she was common. She knew that she was beautiful. But she thought she was ordinary like everybody else. She knew that she was beautiful. But she did not think that there was anything individual about her. She did not think there was anything about her that separated her from everybody else. But then the bridegroom responds and says, As the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. He was letting his bride know, You are not a lily among other lilies. You are not a rose among other rows you are not a flower in a multitude of other flowers but you are a flower in the midst of other thorns can I awaken the bride of Christ to understand exactly how beautiful you are you are not a flower in a multitude of other flowers you are a rose in the middle of a world full of thorns there is only one bride of Christ And when we make statements like uh, we've got to be culturally relevant uh, and we've got to be seeker friendly, what we are doing is we are describing ourselves the same exact way the bride uh, described herself. Uh, She did not think there was anything special about her. We are not another name brand. Uh, We are not some other group of people that has just some ordinary message. Uh, We are the only bride of Christ. Uh, We are the apostolic church. uh, And you've got to understand Understand, we were not meant to fit in with the other thorns in the field. We were meant to be a light in the darkness. We were meant to be joy in the midst of sadness. We were meant to be a flower among the thorns. And he begins to describe her. And the bride is so overwhelmed with their love and their intimacy and their relationship. She says, I am sick of love. 
I'm overwhelmed by it. And in chapter number three, bride begins to seek him. She says, I, I was awakened in the middle of the night and I sought him whom my soul loveth. How many times do we awake in the middle of the night and think it's just restlessness or sleeplessness? But I want God to trust me with fellowship and relationship with Him so well that I can awake in the middle of the night and say, Where is He whom my soul loveth? And three times over the next three verses, she responds and she says, Where is He whom my soul loveth? Three different times over the next three verses, she says, it's he whom my soul loveth. She wanted to get the point across that everything else is secondary. But my relationship with him is primary. And then it gets into verse number four. And we see where she finally finds him. And the Bible said that it was but a little that I passed from them. And I found him whom my soul loveth. And watch this. She said, I held him and would not let him go. What a powerful few words. I held him and would not let him go. You've got to get to the place. Or when you wake up and you go to your place of prayer and you're searching for Him and you're looking for Him and all of a sudden it seems like that flow is just opened up and you tap into that place of intimacy with Him where you value His presence so much that you hold Him and you will not let Him go. And here's the reason why. Because when God visits you, He will keep going if you don't want Him to stay. Those two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, the resurrected Savior, God manifest in the flesh and His glorified body is standing there walking with them. And the Bible said that their eyes were holding that they should not know Him. And He began to expound all the way from, from the, the book of, all the way from Moses to the prophets. Uh, he begins to expound to them all of the sayings in Scripture about who He is and about Himself. Uh, and they were amazed at His sayings. They were, they were confounded at the words that He spoke. Uh, and the Bible said, watch this. Uh, the Bible says He made as if He would have gone further. A visitation came to them. And he was letting them know, if you don't want me to stay, I can keep on going. And the Bible said that they constrained him. They forced him. They said, we don't want you to leave us. And they brought him into the house. And the Bible said as he began to break the bread and began to speak to them about who he was throughout the scripture, the Bible said that their eyes were opened and they knew him. And then he vanished out of their midst. And they looked at one another and they said, surely our hearts did burn within us. God's got to bring us back to that place where our hearts burn within him where our hearts burn within us and when Jesus pays us a visit we hold him and we will not let him go I want God to stay as long as he needs to stay for me to see him the way I'm supposed to see him. And that's a lot of the problem. We wake up and we spend a few minutes in prayer until we talk in tongues and then Jesus keeps on passing us by. Why? Because we were so distracted with what we've got going on throughout the day that we do not constrain him to come into our house and spend time with him. He keeps on going and we miss a visitation and we 
we never see him the way uh, that we are supposed to see him. Uh, but I believe in the Holy Ghost there is fresh revelation uh, that is about to come to somebody's life. Uh, because from this day forward, uh, when Jesus walks into your prayer closet, you're going to wrap your arms around him and hold him until you see him the way you're supposed to see him. They said, William Seymour, the Azusa Street Revival. They said, William Seymour, in longing for the Holy Ghost, and longing for revival would lay his face in a box crate for seven and eight hours a day on his face. Begging for a visitation. And I'm noticing across our movement that the production is getting larger. And the prayer room is getting smaller. You want to know the most revival churches I've ever preached in, Pastor Wright? Some of the most revival churches I've ever preached in have been those churches where you can just walk into the building and you can hear the... There's a roar off in the distance. And it's coming from a place of prayer. Where the saints of God are rocking back and forth. And they're lifting their voice and they're getting a hold of God. We got to get back to that. We got to get back to that in Pentecost. I can remember God first called me to preach. I just wanted to know Him. The greatest move of God that I've ever been a part of has not been in a church service. It's not been at a youth congress. It's not been at a youth camp. It's been under a dark pew somewhere in a dark sanctuary where I got alone with God. And He came and He visited me. Because I was searching for him whom my soul loveth. And when I found him, I held him. And I would not let him go. I wonder if before this service is over tonight, we can get to that place. Where we just wrap him up in our arms. And we hold him and we will not let him go. The Holy Ghost is passing through this room right now. I wonder if, if for just a moment we could stop right here and we could just wrap him in our arms and just hold him. Can we do that? He's here tonight. He is inviting you back to relationship with Him. He is inviting you back to communion with Him. And then over the next few verses we see the very first time there are three major descriptions through the Song of Solomon that the bridegroom gives about his bride. But in chapter number 3 from verses 6 through 10 we see the, the, the very first description 
the beginning of the very first description that the bridegroom gives about his bride. And it said, Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like the pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant? And watch this. Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Three score valiant men are about it of the valiant of Israel. They hold swords, being expert in war. Every man hath his sword upon his thigh. Why? Because of fear in the night. Think about that for a minute. This is a procession. The bride and his groom are headed to their wedding ceremony. And he has crafted a bed, but it's not a bed that you sleep on. When you study that out, it's more of a couch uh, that those valiant men would lift up on their shoulders uh, and they would carry the bride. Uh, and it would, be a, it would be a caravan and they would carry that bride and she would be sitting up on that couch uh, and she would be elevated for everybody to see uh, on her way to the wedding. Uh, but look at what it said. It said that they were rising up out of the wilderness and that she was surrounded with valiant men that have got swords because of fear in the night that ought to let you know that we are the bride of Christ and in this hour we are rising out of the wilderness and if we have ever walked through the night it is in the hour that we are living in right now but I've come to preach against every spirit of fear that wants to attack the bride of Christ and let you know that God is raising up valiant men in this hour that are going to fight for the bride of Christ. Uh, we don't need to have fear in the night because God has made sure the bride is going to be protected. There shall be light in the evening time. We don't need to have fear in the night uh, because God has raised up valiant men that will surround the bride of Christ. And we're headed to that wedding day. And the closer we get to that wedding day, the darker and the darker and the darker that it gets. Can I remind you of those, of those ten virgins in the New Testament? Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. The five wise had oil in their lamps and the five foolish did not have oil in their lamps. And when you study that out, the bridegroom would exit his chamber and they would sound an alarm in the middle of the night to let them know uh, that the bridegroom is on his way. And until the, until the bride heard uh, that the bridegroom was on the way, uh, she was supposed to remain in her closet uh, in preparation for her wedding day. I fear that the bride has left its closet of prayer too soon. Because we've not heard that trumpet sound. And we have not seen those eastern skies part. And God has not come back for His bride yet. And so until that day comes, the apostolic church better make sure that we get back to our closet of prayer so that we can prepare for the coming of the bridegroom. And in that first major description of his bridegroom, or of his bride, beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, over the next six verses, he gives seven compliments to his bride. It is the first major description that he gives to his bride. And it consists of seven major compliments, uh, about seven different attributes. Uh, what he was doing is he was letting her know she is perfect to him. Don't let the enemy deceive you into thinking that the bride of Christ is not perfect for Jesus Christ. He was not just letting her know that she is perfect. He was letting her know that she is perfect for him. That's why he said, Thou art all fair, my love, and there is no spot in thee. He was saying, You're not just perfect, but you were perfect for me. And that's the way that God views you. When it comes to relationship with Him. I think a lot of the time the reason we avoid relationship with Him. Is because we don't understand exactly how He views us. 
He does not view us the same way you and I view ourselves. He views us as a bride that is perfect, that he wants love, and that he wants fellowship, and that he wants communion with. He begins to describe her, and this is what he said. I, I want you to notice this, this one important description of her. And I know we're taking some time here, but just, just go with me. We're all right. He said, thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Look at the picture that God is trying to paint here about his bride. He was saying your hair is dark and it is long and it looks like a flock of black goats uh, that are descending down the side of a mountain. It is amazing to me that when the bridegroom began to describe his bride, she had long hair. Because the king will not have an uncovered bride. The king will not have an uncovered bride. Let's lift our hands right here and let's, let's just take a minute. I want you to open your spirit in this house. I'm 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 coming to a close but I I want you to look at something here. That is the first major description that the bridegroom gives about his bride. And then when you get into chapter number 5 the maiden the bride begins to describe a dream that she has. She said, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. He had gone through a lot of inconvenience just to have fellowship and intimacy with his bride. I've walked through the darkness and the dew of the night. My hair and my clothes are wet. But that's how badly he wants relationship with us. But this is what the bride responds with. She says, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I've washed my feet. How shall I defile them? She did not answer the knock on the door when he praised her. She did not answer the knock on the door when he explained his inconvenience. She did not answer the knock on the door Whenever he called unto her and she heard his voice. She said, I've already put off my coat. I've already fallen into a place of sleep and slumber. I've already gotten comfortable. And then she says, my beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door. And she said, I rose up to open to my beloved. And she said, I opened to him, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. 
And she said, my soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. He came seeking relationship, but she was already comfortable. After all of the praise he had just given her and explained and described to her how perfect she was to him, she still would not get up out of her place of comfort to open the door for relationship. It is amazing to me the bride was okay with being desired, but she was not okay with being disrupted. I can remember one time I woke up in the morning and the Holy Ghost, it was so real, it was so tangible. And I woke up and, and, and I could feel that, I could feel that invitation to the chamber. I could feel God drawing me to a place of fellowship and intimacy and, and communion with Him. But for whatever reason, I began to get distracted throughout my day and I made a mental note. I said, later tonight I'm going to go up to the church and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pray and I'm going to spend time with Him. And no matter what I did throughout the entire day, I could feel that continual nudge. I could feel that continual drawing. I could feel that continual pulling from the Holy Ghost to come away to arise my love my fair one and come away with me and I went up to the church later that night about 1130 or midnight and I began to walk around and I began to pace back and forth and I began to seek him and all of a sudden it seemed like that flow had just been completely shut off and I said God you've been trying to fellowship with me all day you've been trying to call me away to a place of prayer and talk with you all day I said I'm here here now and I'm ready to talk and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said next time I ask to speak to you let's do it on my time not yours I was okay with being desired by him but I wasn't okay being disrupted by him It was a missed opportunity for fellowship and relationship with him. And she said, she said, I ran out into the street looking for him because I missed this opportunity to spend time with him. And she said, the watchmen that went about this city found me and they smote me, they wounded me. The keepers of the walls, they took away my veil from me. You've got to understand that it was not customary for Middle Eastern women to wander the streets at night without their husband. And it was certainly not customary for them to wander the streets at night in search of a man. And so whenever they found her, they mistook her for a harlot uh, and they beat her. Can I tell you that when you truly get desperate uh, for relationship with him, uh, there will be people that misunderstand your pursuit for him. I'm sorry, but I can't go hang out tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost talking to me and he wants me to come away and spend time with him. I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't play basketball on Monday night. The Holy Ghost has been trying to call me away uh, and spend time in prayer and fellowship with him. Uh, I'm sorry I'm a little late to church, Pastor. The Lord woke me up at four in the morning and I rolled out of bed uh, and it was my beloved, it was my fair one. He was knocking on the door to spend time with me. Oh, God, that we would not be so consumed with being desired that we won't let you disrupt us. What a tragedy. She opens that door. She opens that door and he's nowhere to be found and all that's left is the fragrance. The fragrance, the aroma that he left behind.
It is my chief desire every day simply to know him. I told you a little about my testimony this morning. And I know this is rare form. I don't feel like I have to qualify. I'm in the Holy Ghost. I'm not worried about that. But at 15 years old, when God called me to that place of loneliness and fellowship with him, it was in that moment that Jesus became my best friend. But ever since then, I've been trying to become his best friend. What I hope happens by the end of this service is that somebody somewhere would get to a place like those two disciples that when Jesus broke bread in their house and their eyes were opened and they saw him, they say, my heart burned within me. I would to God that somebody somewhere in this room would just close your eyes and begin to rock back and forth. And let your heart just burn within you. We get desperate for revival. We get desperate for miracles, signs, and wonders. We get desperate for a deeper anointing, for a greater level of ministry. But I wonder when is the last time that we just got desperate to be close to Him? Because when she could not find Him, she said once again, she said, I am sick of love. Now, this is the second time that she said that. She said it once in chapter 2, I am sick of love. But now she's saying it again in chapter 5, I am sick of love. But the difference is, uh, is the first time she said I am sick of love uh, was because of the pleasure of his presence. Uh, but now the second time she is saying I am sick of love uh, was because of the pain of his absence. I don't want to just be so tuned into the Spirit that I know when He is close. I also want to know when He is far. Thank you, Brother Isaac. That's the posture we need to become acquainted with. God forgive us that we've been so consumed with revival and so consumed with secondary things that we thought revival was our first calling. No, that's not our first calling. The place of labor is not our first calling. The place of love is our first calling. I wonder if there'd be anybody that would just not not get up out of your seat but just roll out of your seat and just fall on your face. Because Jesus is knocking in this house here today. We got to get back to brokenness. We got to get back to a longing for relationship. Come on, there are some saints you've been living for God for a long time. Have you ever in your life been in a posture of brokenness where you just laid on your face and said, God, let me get access to your chamber. Let me get access to that secret place. Come on, bride. You are perfect, but you are not just perfect. You are perfect for him. You are not a lily in the valley. You are not a rose of Sharon. You are a rose among thorns. As you lift your voice and intercede and travail and enter into warfare, I wish you'd lift your voice and let this place shake right now with a yearning and a desire for relationship with Jesus. Oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Come on, I've watched this church dance and shout and go to warfare and you shake this house uh, with a praise. Uh, I wonder if you can shake this house uh, with a heart that burns within you uh, for relationship with Him. Come on, all over the house, lift your voice. Uh, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Uh, Come on, you gotta get back to the chamber. You gotta get back to the closet.
Come on, that's it. Lift your voice all over this house. Let God recalibrate you. Let God. Come on, God wants to use some of you, but you got to start off on the right foot. He's not going to first call you to the pulpit without calling you to the prayer closet. Come on, elder, saying to God, you can't let that altar die. That old rocking chair you go to in the morning with your cup of coffee, you can't let cobwebs get built up in your place of prayer. You got to go back to the chamber. You got to go back to the place of love. Come on, wrap him in your arms. Don't let him go until you see him the way you're supposed to see him. There ought to be a young man in this house lift his voice with the call of God on his life. Don't you ever get to the place you prioritize ministry over your relationship. That's it. There needs to be some travail in this house. There needs to be intercession in this house. You want revival, but my question is, uh, how bad do you want to know him? How bad do you want to be close to him? He's got to be your best friend. Come on, I don't think we're quite desperate enough in this house. There's got to be moaning and groaning in this house. Your heart has got to burn within you. Come on, God's bringing you back to that place. That place you used to be when God first filled you with the Holy Ghost. You used to pray every day. You used to linger in the altar every service. You used to wrestle with Him on a weekly basis. When's the last time your heart burned within you, not for revival, but for relationship? God, disrupt us. Disrupt us. Don't let us be so asleep that when you knock, we will not awaken and open the door. Disrupt us out of complacency. Disrupt us out of religiosity. Disrupt us out of the status quo. We want you. We want you. We want you. Come on, that's it. Lift your voice. He's visiting us in this house. Wrap him in your arms. Wrap him in your arms.
Come on, that's it. We're peeling back layers in this house right now. There's deeper depths. There's deeper depths in this house. Come on, there's a visitation in this room right now. There's a revival coming to this church. A harvest is going to be birthed, but right now there is relationship being established to a greater level between the bride and the bridegroom. Come on, we got to know him. Come on, mothers of Zion, travail. Come on, hatarabo rasa tayarabaya sanda. Let it out. Let it out. Reach down into your gut and let it out. Let your heart burn within you. Come on, that's it. There's another level right now. How bad do you want him? We know how bad you want revival. Now how bad do you want Jesus? Go! Angels just walked into this house. Go! There's fresh revelation for you. Go! Wrap him up in your arms! Come on, elder saint of God! Stir up that gift that's in you. We need you to lead the way for this generation. Show us how to yearn for him. Show us how to desire him. Show us how to seek his face. Go.